Hello again. This video is going to spotlight a couple of examples of natural selection in action. It's really important as scientists to expect that whenever we learn about a particular scientific thought that there are evidence and examples that support that thought. We'll talk about the evidence for evolution in another video, but for the purpose of this video we're just going to spotlight a couple of examples of natural selection in, in action to see the dynamics that we talked about in our natural selection video at work. Of course I'm going to start with an example that isn't quite natural selection, which is the evolution of organisms like this and organisms like this. This of course is an example of artificial selection since humans are the organisms that are most responsible for driving the transition from wolves to dogs, but the dynamics are very, very similar. The only difference of course being that the evolutionary pressure in an artificial selection situation is human desires and human needs, whereas in natural selection it's the requirements of any particular environment that a population lives in. The major question that we're going to answer in this video is what does natural selection look like? We'll look at two different examples. Our first example is going to be antibiotic resistance in bacteria. And our second example is going to look at a group of birds known as Darwin's finches. In all cases, we're going to look at natural selection acting on the phenotype of an organism. This word refers to an organism's physical traits. So for instance, this leafy sea dragon has a phenotype that makes it look like the seaweed that it lives in to help it camouflage with its surroundings. This notion of natural selection acting upon the phenotypes of an organism is universal and is what we're going to focus on in the two examples that we're going to look at. Antibiotics are a group of chemicals that damage or destroy bacterial cells. Bacterial cells are of course too small for us to see with the naked eye, but the colonies of bacterial cells are visible when they get large enough. In the case of the antibiotic sensitive petri dish that you see here, the bacteria were grown until they occupied the entire surface of the petri dish. It's that brownish grayish color that you see on the edges of the plate. At that point, different antibiotics were soaked on paper discs and those paper discs were placed onto the plate. As those antibiotics diffused out of the disc and so we get a space in the covering of the bacteria on the plate, which is what has given rise to that pattern of empty space or what they call the zone of clearance around each of those antibiotic discs in the image. Comparing that with antibiotic resistant bacteria, you can see the difference. Notice that this antibiotic resistant bacterial population is not as affected by several of the antibiotics as the antibiotic sensitive population is. We see that that zone of clearance is nowhere near as large around some of those discs, and in some discs there's no clearance at all. That's because these bacteria have evolved resistance to some of these antibiotics. The antibiotics will no longer affect them like they affect an antibiotic sensitive population. Let's investigate how this works a little bit more closely. When thinking about the evolution of resistance, probably not a bad idea to visualize what that bacterial population looked like before selection occurred. Remember that every member of every population has variations, and that's of course true of our bacterial population as well. Before they were ever exposed to those antibiotics, some bacterial cells had variations that already made them somewhat resistant to those antibiotics. But it was only after they were exposed to the antibiotics that selection actually occurred. And only cells that were resistant to the antibiotics survived. As we know from our discussions of natural selection, the survivors are the most fit and the most fit get to reproduce. Any genetic components of that resistance are passed on to their offspring, with the result being that our final population of bacteria is composed of individuals who are almost entirely resistant to those antibiotics. In the macro sense, this is how a phenotype like antibiotic resistance evolves in a population of bacteria. Let's look at the specific cellular details of what happens in a bacterial cell that contributes to its resistance. What this graphic shows us is a bacterial enzyme that's involved in constructing bacterial cell walls. The cell wall is an organelle that bacteria need in order to survive. This enzyme's entire job is to help the bacteria make new cell walls. This enzyme also happens to be the main target of antibiotics like penicillin. The antibiotic molecules interact with that enzyme and block the ability of that enzyme to continue to do its job. Since that enzyme no longer functions, the cell walls can no longer be built and the bacteria die. In an antibiotic resistant bacteria, shown below the antibiotic sensitive version, the cell wall building enzyme has changed its structure slightly. It can still build cell walls and thereby contribute to the survival and fitness of the bacterial cell, but it is no longer able to interact with the antibiotic. As a result, when the antibiotic is present in the environment, these bacteria can continue to build their cell walls and continue to survive and reproduce. This is just one example of how antibiotic resistance can develop in a population of bacteria, but you can see that the resistance is a direct product of the enzyme structure phenotype of that bacteria. For our second example, let's go to an organism that we actually can see as individuals, a group of birds that live on the Galapagos Islands known as Darwin's finches. There are more than 10 different species of Darwin's finches, which are classified based on the shape of their beaks, where they live, and what they eat. 
we're going to focus on one particular species, which is the medium ground finch. And we're going to look at ongoing research that's being done by Rosemary and Peter Grant on an island in the Galapagos called Daphne Major. Many of the islands in the Galapagos are really big, but Daphne Major is not one of those. Daphne Major is less than a kilometer in diameter, which means that you could walk around the entire island in a few hours. So it's an ideal place to study evolution if you want to be able to measure the characteristics of all of the members of a species that live in a particular environment. And that's what the Grants have been doing. For over 30 years, they've gone to Daphne Major every year, trapped all of the members of the medium ground finch population on the island, recorded their physical characteristics, and then let them go again. They've repeated this year after year, and they've seen some really interesting things. We're going to focus on one specific event, which was a drought that occurred on the island in 1977. Comparing the population of medium ground finches that survived the drought to those medium ground finches that did not survive the drought, we can see that there is a statistically significant difference in the beak depth between survivors and non-survivors. That difference is an average of less than one millimeter, but that slightly larger beak made all the difference for the birds that were living on the island at the time and determined whether or not they would be able to feed themselves and survive or whether they would perish with the drought. Again here, we can see that natural selection is acting upon the phenotypes of the organisms in the population, determining which members of the population will survive and reproduce and which ones will not. We're gonna pause here and talk about another misconception that people have when thinking about evolution, which is the idea that evolution is a random process. There are certainly random evolutionary processes, but we haven't talked about any of those yet. Natural selection is not a random evolutionary process. Natural selection is driving the adaptation of populations through the selection of particular phenotypes as determined by their environmental fitness. And that is the exact opposite of a random process. The analogy I like to think about when thinking about selection is a search engine. When I go to Google and type in what I'm looking for, Google searches through the internet, selects all of the results that match what I'm looking for, and brings them back to me. Natural selection works pretty much the same way. Of course, the major difference is, instead of it being me specifying their criteria for successful results, environmental conditions are determining which organisms are best adapted and survive, and which ones do not. Thanks so much for watching our discussion of a couple of examples of natural selection at work. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you describe how natural selection can affect the phenotype of an organism. And also make sure that you can explain how antibiotic resistance and the changes that we see in the beaks of Darwin's finches provide examples of evolution. If you can do those two things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.